Welcome to the news segment from the Roll for Crit podcast, a board gaming podcast released weekly on Wednesdays. This week, we were joined by Danny Standring, who you probably know if you've looked at board gaming contact anywhere on the internet. So go ahead and hope you're excited for what news we have to tell you for the week of December 13th, 2021. You know that sound means we're talking about the news. Of course, we are going to talk a lot about PAX Unplugged, the convention we attended. But first, some general news, one big one in particular, a weird one that popped up in the last week. Kickstarter, which is obviously huge in the board game world. Many board games are funded through the crowdfunding platform of Kickstarter. They have announced that they are going to be adopting blockchain technology and infusing that into their website in the future. Not right away. The way it's going to work is they are actually starting a separate organization, a separate company, some kind of a, like a subsidiary of Kickstarter that's going to have its own blockchain crowdfunding technology. And then as time goes on, that's kind of going to have the kinks worked out of it. Kickstarter itself will adopt that tech under the hood. Blockchain technology, for anyone who is not familiar, is how cryptocurrency works. That's sort of the underlying foundation of Bitcoin and all that stuff. And it's essentially, as I understand it, a database that is very secure and has different ways of checking and making sure that everyone's data is uh, under control and there's no confusion as to who owns what or what is transferred where. According to Kickstarter, this is not going to have any real effect on the front end of the site. For the, for the users, everything is going to basically look and feel the same, but it should have more effects under the hood. Uh, what those effects are, I don't know if I know what they are, but we can try to get into it. Now, Danny, I know that uh, you're not a, a blockchain expert. No, not even. <laughs> and that was be my main question is, so what is like the business advantage to doing this? Like why is, you know, just good old dollar bills not good enough anymore? And again, I am a super noob when it comes to cryptocurrency and blockchain. So when I see something like this, it's intriguing, but I it's also daunting because I have no idea what this means. So I thought I saved this to Doc a while back, but I found a tweet, someone saying that they actually found out why, and this is apparently dodging laws, more or less. Oh, I, I think that. there's like r- rules coming in Europe, which actually will make any crowdfunding site like that to change if they can track it. And if, it, if a project fails, like Kickstarter would be liable to pay back people. Is this but a is this somehow, a rumor or is this like a hundred percent? We think that's the reason. I, it, it's rumored. It's not okay. an official, but, but like it, it would make sense that kicks if a company. Why is it? Why are they doing it to avoid paying money? Like, <laughs> interesting. Uh, yeah, and go. apparently, because the blockchain, the way it works, it'd be harder to track and can't prove the things as much. I guess or something like that. Hmm. Uh, which at least to me makes makes sense because that's unless a Kickstarter is planning to release a NFT pages, <laughs> like <laughs> right, like why? Yeah, what is the purpose? I mean, the other the slightly less conspiratorial conspiracy theory that that I have is, you know, it's a blockchain is a, a buzzword right now. It's just a thing that people are talking about. So by Getting on board with new technology, it's just kind of a publicity thing for they them. They said that was it too for stockholders to be like, look, fancy <laughs> word. Yeah, so so maybe that's part of it. Now, in the announcement, they state a few of the benefits of this. It's quoting from their page. It's easy to reward participation. Um, there is a composability factor. I honestly don't even know what this means. They have some words after that that don't mean much to me. <laughs> and also efficient participation in governance is another one of the bullet points here. I think they, I don't think they know what the benefit of this is. <laughs> it's all very, it's very weird to me. Uh, I I know probably as much as, as you do Danny about anything related to blockchain. So you're, you're not, you're not, you're in a good company here with me. <laughs> no, this is I- all weird. And, and, and it's funny because as you were saying, you think it's a publicity thing in my head. I was like, are they just trying to like fit in right now and like generate some sort of news for Kickstarter? Because now like 
having heard you say that, I'm like, oh, I feel like that's totally it. We're just trying to be like cool and in the now again. Well, it worked. We, no, they got us talking did. about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess yeah. they did it. <laughs> I remember uh, when they announced uh, this. It's one of, those, one of the fun things when you go on Twitter and no one actually says the initial thing of why everyone's either upset or discussing something. So I'm like, everyone's talking about blockchains and, and NFTs now. Why? With board games? <laughs> oh, it's Kickstarter like five or ten minutes later. <laughs> you got to dig. You got to dig for All it. circled back right around. <laughs> It would be interesting, I think, if maybe down the line this leads to Kickstarter accepting cryptocurrency as a form of payment for projects. That and I could see that happening. I don't know, and it would be it could, that could be the brave new future that maybe Kickstarter is leading for. This board is games a Dogecoin only project. <laughs> I mean, that's that's what I'm hoping for. You know, I've got millions invested in Dogecoin. It's my life savings is in there. So, <laughs> all for one board game in 2025. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. The next, the next, the third Gloomhaven is all my Dogecoin is going Crypto towards Haven. That. There you go. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if that if that's where it goes. I mean, there's some like local markets around me that actually accept cryptocurrency, like grocery store stores like buildings like real companies that accept cryptocurrency which is wild yeah. to me to see that on the storefront and i walk in i'm like i'm just here for tomatoes and milk <laughs> <laughs> yeah given that it almost seems strange that kickstarter doesn't accept it already you know it's such an it's an only an online platform so maybe this is them angling towards that that's the only that's me struggling to come up with an actual concrete thing that this that could come about from this but i don't know that you would need to totally redo your the structure of your website with blockchain just to accept cryptocurrency so i don't know who knows what this might do it sounds like probably for most people nothing it, it won't really matter <laughs> and that's why we're discussing it here on the podcast we only talk about the most important uh issues let's move on to pax unplugged which we were all in attendance at last weekend we'll talk a little bit about some of our general thoughts and everything about the show but there was one big announcement relating to gloomhaven and frosthaven the giant dungeon crawl board game from cephalo fair specifically that they are going to be releasing their own crowdfunding campaign which i suppose by the time it comes out maybe kickstarter will be on the blockchain front at that point uh that is going to be for miniatures it's called miniatures of gloomhaven and they're going to be offering up different miniatures for all of the monsters throughout the original Gloomhaven, its expansion, Frosthaven, and Jaws of the Lion. So a separate box, not included with the games. It's going to be expensive. There's going to be a lot of minis. We don't know exactly all the details yet, but this is exciting for people who have wanted those minis for a long time. Danny, where do you stand on... Uh, Gloomhaven, and do you have a strong feeling one way or the other between minis and standees in board games? So I actually would like to consider myself an expert in this because I, I feel like every gaming group that plays Gloomhaven, everyone has their own job, like either setup, breakdown, uh, dealing with the monsters, dealing with combat, dealing with effects. In my group, I am the person that deals with the monsters. I'm the one always setting up the standees. I'm the one, you know, dealing out the damage, taking the damage, just managing the overall monster turn. And when I first heard this, I was like, man, that's going to be so cool. And then the more I thought about it in my, my little system that I have for setting up the standees, I was like, huh, this might be actually pretty cumbersome. And we have this ongoing joke within our group. It's definitely a New England thing, so I apologize for the like really terrible accent coming up. <laughs> um, the yeah. monsters, like the non-heroic ones, we just call them regulars. Like you're going to go order a coffee <laughs> from Dunkin's. And then we the heroic ones, we call them extra extras so like when we're calling out you know what monsters we need i was like i need two extra extras one regular and it's like the most ridiculous conversation and last night when i was sitting down thinking about these minis i actually got a set of these minis and they're super cool um mm -hmm. there's just one massive one i think i would really like a set for the extra extra so the heroic guys um because even though like the standees the the regulars are denoted by the white stands and the heroics are 
the yellow. And I feel like I'm even saying those wrong. I'm so used to calling them by their stupid Dunkin' Donuts coffee <laughs> names that I'm like, I'm pretty sure they're not called that. Um, but for the bigger guys, I think I would really like some miniatures for those just to separate them from the regular ones to give them a little bit more of like, all right, that's a big guy and then he's going to come and get me. They suck a little bit more and kind of as a reminder that they do extra things. Um, but as far as like a full set, I'm just picturing like my board with like 20 guys out. Like, where am I going to store those? <laughs> where am I going to put them? Yeah. I already look like I'm in a command station trying <laughs> to set up the board with the, with the baddies. I don't know what I would do with all those minis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, it's really even just on your shelf before you take them out, it's going to start looking like Will's Cthulhu Wars collection. <laughs> it's just like boxes. Yes, and boxes. I have <laughs> extra boxes for that. In fact, uh, while I, we were at PAX, uh, uh, my box of more expansion for the Power Rangers game came in, which has a lot of minis too of like minions and stuff. And I recently just had to like, all right, I'm going to rebag and change these things, try to get this all to fit. So. I, I on that front, I'd be very worried. Like I almost, uh, this, I'm like, I feel like I need a dedicated shelf for miniatures. For real, <laughs> yeah. You need a room. You need a room for them. Uh, that yeah. said, yeah, I feel depending on how they split this up, the one thing I would really like, and I'm hoping for, is there a separate package just for the summons. Like that was the. Ooh. I feel like there are standees, but the summons in Gloomhaven. I, I can't. I don't think Jaws of the Lion. I think Jaws of the Lion did the same thing. I can't remember now, but they were just sort of magical circles mm -hmm. like i feel there's something like it, you're summoned you feel much more like i want to see my rat or my hawks you know whatever animal you're able to summon or i guess not always animal so i feel like that would be the one i would be willing to go the extra mile for yeah. and it'd probably be a little smaller yeah, I think both of those. I I hope they do. Is a, a summons only or a just just the just the extra extras? I think would be good. <laughs> uh, I, and I, yeah, I don't. I have. I would guess. I don't know. I my thinking would be they aren't going to do that <laughs> because it just seems too specific. And I feel like they're going to try to package it in a way that you're going to want to like buy a little bit of everything and maybe you'll just end up buying everything. I don't know. They said they were still experimenting with exactly how they're going to do it. It is Kickstarter. So maybe they'll have more specific. Well, it's tiers. crowdfunding. Right. Sorry. They, it's my, they didn't say Kickstarter. Yes. Yeah, so it sounds like they could be going to game found or something else. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, we'll find out about that. Generally speaking, I know Will and I are, standee proponents i i like standees i think that when they're the art is good they can look good on a table i don't really need a mini for every single thing i would agree with you for the most part but i will say at least my copy of gloomhaven i have multiple cardboard standees that half of the side of the art has fallen off <laughs> hmm. yeah no, that's not as good <laughs> I don't know whether it's because Gloomhaven's a campaign thing, and so I, you know, you keep taking them on and off, and I'm ruining them that way. But I, that is something that has bothered me a little bit. But like I said, I don't know whether it's the game or me <laughs> who's destroying them. I would have to agree with the standees. I'm trying to think. There was another game we pre played recently that I felt the same. I think it's Mansions of Madness, where there's mm. standees and there's some minis, and I prefer the standees because I like the art. I like looking at them and. Honestly, I think it's easier to read, especially if there's text on the ground or if there's ground effects. I, I just feel like it's a little bit easier to navigate what's going on on the map with those. The, yeah. Well, the biggest thing for me, so this is much more, um, I think, a Kickstarter kind of thing, is when they offer both because just I think it opens the door for more people to be like, I don't need to spend three times the price. Like the minis are nice, but mm -hmm. being able to actually play the game with colorful standees instead that like maybe even half the price or something is very nice. And, you know, especially if you're not someone who paints all your stuff. Yeah. I think that's the big difference is that if you're somebody who paints their minis, then you're like, okay, obviously I'm going all in. Cause then you get both sides of it. It's will be thematic and easy to read, but as a non painter, <laughs> I'm not as into that. I always think of dead of winter as being uh, a game that stands out in my mind as having a ton of standees that look really good. And I, have no desire for them to be minis i'm i'm happy with all the different zombies and stuff that they have in that game uh, but that's not the way that the industry is trending these days people people like 3d plastic <laughs> so who we might need to it? bling out our games <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it seems that way so we'll see miniatures of gloomhaven launching somewhere sometime next year 
uh, presumably after Frosthaven has been released, but that's also still up in the air. Now, as I said, PAX Unplugged, big deal, big deal, big, fun, exciting convention. Their first return to Philadelphia. They were not around last year because of the pandemic. Everybody there was masked and vaccinated, which is always very encouraging, unlike uh, Gen Con this year, which did not require vaccinations necessarily. And there was a lot of stuff to see and do there. We did a lot of things. We'll talk about maybe some of the games we actually played in the table talk section later on. But Danny, I'm curious, was this your first time at PAX Unplugged? Had you been before? And what was your overall impressions of the show? Yeah, so this was actually my second time. We went the first year PAX Unplugged was a thing in 2017. Mm. It was so much smaller when we went. Um, And it was funny. We were driving down. I was like, what did we play the first time we went? And I just like vaguely remember playing like hero realms for like three days straight um (laughs) my experience then very different from my experience now um this time around this was probably one of the best conventions i've ever been to and i'm like a lifelong pax easter we go every year um back in my video gaming days we would always go and see like the big triple a announcements and it was always like fun but there was like an air about this convention where people just felt so excited to play a game like everywhere i went like people were hype on buying games and it was it was a ton of fun and i left there sunday feeling really good about my experience over the weekend i saw so many games i met so many cool people and i i i really have not one bad bad thing to say about the weekend i was i was very impressed with the overall experience Yeah, I don't think I have any complaints. It's interesting you mentioned the the size discrepancy because, yeah, we we were also there that first year and it was, I mean, it was, there were like 18 people there, I think. (laughs) It was was, was little. (laughs) And it did get bigger in subsequent years. And I didn't think that this year, I I heard different things from, from different people who were there. I saw some people saying they thought it did feel significantly smaller than the 2019 show to my mind it it didn't feel that different I I felt like the attendance levels were roughly the same it was not overwhelming but uh, there was a healthy number of people there were tons of people playing games at all those tables Mm -hmm. all the time Uh, Will what do you think about the that level of it from this time to last to the 2019 or before one of the things I like is that I think because it's near the end of the year well i mean we just talked about the gloomhaven announcement it doesn't feel nearly as much of like when we go to gen con i feel like there's so much like we need to stay on top of there's all this important things that's going to happen in a regular year you know we're waiting for fantasy flight to drop their random announcement usually on, in mid saturday when this feels like we can focus more on like the community and gaming like meeting people and such yeah yeah for the sake of meeting people i mean <laughs> yeah it does it definitely feels like I, the packs unplugged is a little bit more laid back the there's not as much oh man the new hotness so hype gotta get to that booth and stand in a line for an hour <laughs> to try to play something uh instead it's to go to the games library and like you know just pray that the thing you're trying to play <laughs> is the copy is there no one's taking it out at that time i there's there's panels I never do any panels at Gen Con. There's, we're just like too busy. There's no time. But we did a few different panels this year, including the Frosthaven one. You ever do any of those panels, Danny? I don't. So I am not a panel person. I don't know why. I like, I think I'm just too like my ADD kicks in and I just want to see everything. I want to touch everything. Like I'm excited <laughs> to go sit down. But this year I actually um, – did a learn and play and then i taught a learn and play too so i'm starting to like this is my first time like coexisting with a a panel and like things outside of the main floor and I'm, i think i felt the allure of it i was like i think i want to do this again and not just come for the show floor like i want to like you know find those little niche things that i like to see and you know like dig into it so it was it, this was like a big learning experience for me so it wasn't just me as like a novice board gamer it was like me as like a hobbyist going into it i'm like this is this feels cool and i brought my kid too so she was like eyes wide open like oh this is really cool like this is this is what you you guys do you nerds like i think i'm in on this now (laughs) how old is she she's 13 so okay she's always played board games with us but never like 
you know, actively pursuing it. Like if we knock on her door, I'm like, Hey, you want to come play quacks with us? She'll be like, okay. But she's now inquiring about games. And like, we taught her how to play deck builders this weekend. She's like, this is really cool. She's like, can I learn how to play magic? I'm like, you're crazy if that's the first thing you want to do, but sure. <laughs> yes. Yes. Join magic. The gathering. <laughs> I'm <in> the child. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dangerous road to go down, but that's cool. That's, that's really exciting. Uh, and yeah, I, I definitely feel that. I, I think you should host a panel next year. What's your what, what would your panel be if you if you were going to give an hour long presentation on something? What would your blockchain right? Be? Yeah, I sign me up, <laughs> expert in this. I am up there. A whole presentation, give me a laser pointer and everything. I got you. An hour long panel. I don't. I'm one of those people that could talk forever like and just segue from topic to topic so i think i could go into a panel and like the title would be like unknown and we would just go with it we would just ride <laughs> there you the go. sunset mystery panel open up the box and see what happens <laughs> yeah it's an interesting thing because i feel like video game and movie st- conventions those have like established panels and usually they also have a a plus because they could have like an actor show up or something mm. board games don't have as much of a celebrity thing so sometimes it's like what is this panel who's talking and why uh, but uh i i like that they're pushing them and i i think it's an interesting avenue to go down there's some cool discussions that can be had there uh any other uh either either one of you like specific maybe a cool really cool booth that was on the floor or something, or maybe just how about local food <laughs> that, oh was, that God, was worth talking about? Food. <laughs> I, I, maybe this will, my panel should be about food. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when we, we went to that little, you know, market across the street, that big, mm-hmm. yeah, big yeah. market, and I went and got a gyro or hero as people call it. I, I'm, <laughs> I go back and forth. Um, yeah, yeah. I love gyros, and this sandwich almost brought me to tears. It was so good. <laughs> <laughs> it's all I could think about. But let me tell you, eating a gyro and then putting a mask on for the day is the worst decision I've ever made because <laughs> it was so onion and garlicky. I no, I'm glad I did have a mask because I would have offended people with my breath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that is a benefit of masks. That is true. Yeah, I love that market across the street is just incredible. It's got every kind of food you could imagine. Uh, it's really a great location. Even we had to deal with the issue of parking at the right side of the convention center, which because there's like one entrance really to get to PAX Unplugged, or maybe two, <laughs> and there's a building that takes up four blocks. <laughs> so at least at least twice uh, we end up ended up like walking right instead of left and going for a ten minute walk around the building instead of just right to the door. <laughs> But that's okay. It's it's good exercise because we did spend a lot of the convention just sitting down that's and true. playing games. <laughs> uh, and uh, my my other weak spot at these conventions, I think Will's Will's a, bit, a little better at it than I am. Uh, you know, trying to see people that maybe we've talked to online before and meet up with them and hang out with them, especially with masks on. I like can't tell who anybody is, it's, and I don't notice anyone. <laughs> it's brutal. I felt so bad because i feel like i have like a lot of good online relationships with people i love chatting with people like i'm always in comments having good discussions and when i get approached or if i'm approaching someone they're like hey we we chatted last night and i'm like oh god we did and immediately like again i'm glad i have a mask on because i'll go beat red and i'm like embarrassed (laughs) I i am so sorry but i did see a fantastic idea so Tim from Thunderworks had his mm. profile picture on a pin on his lanyard. And uh, fortunately, I'd met Tim before, so I, I knew who he was. But I'm like, that is genius. And I think we all need to have like a name tag or a pin with a profile picture and our like handles. So we'd be like, oh, that's you. And and I'd be good <laughs> to go. And that's I think that's what was great about Gen Con because our names were on all the badges. So I could kind of snipe out a name before I start talking to someone. I'm like, okay, I do know the other person. Yeah. Yeah. The big thing, Jonathan, I'm not better than you. I was just like, this this packs, I was like, I want to see people. I want to say hi to them. We've been having this podcast and having guests on. For once, I want to meet them in person. So I was just like 
trying to do that ex like focus harder. Like, I think I see them. The problem is though, then I'm like, they're doing something I'm like, I don't want to interrupt them. So I'll stand there looking at them a little bit. I'm like now I'm being weird and I feel like I need to walk away. <laughs> yeah. Speed yeah. Stars. That happens a lot too. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, you, you got to really turn your, your homing lasers on. Yeah. It's so much easier with names on the badges <laughs> i do wish there were names sometimes uh it's also nice when people are in a booth so like they work for that booth that helps narrow it down a little bit <laughs> there, there's a struggle to be had all around but yeah we had a lot of fun i think we spent a lot of our time just playing games in the games library uh we perused the floor a little bit i, I bought a few things nothing too crazy but a, a couple of things i was excited about um, yeah, I got a Cascadia. That was like I, the other big thing. I was like, I need to get that. Everyone's talking about it. I, I, I remember seeing it at Gen Con just being like, eh, it's probably fine and good, but I can wait. And then when everyone starts saying, this is amazing, I'm like, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, you made that purchase. Uh, there's, they have the new Unmatched set there, which is pretty cool and exciting. Uh, in terms of games we didn't actually get to play, but like stuff we saw, I mean, I, we're, we're going to have videos for them on our Roll for Crit YouTube channel, but a Jurassic Park world the legacy of isla nublar was probably to me that was the most exciting new hotness thing at the show and i think the coolest booth as well to complement it but it, we didn't get to play it but man it looks we yeah. sat down and touched it and looked at it, <laughs> it actually really being able cool. to see it that was also pretty big in terms of an announcement it, like it wasn't new we knew of the the legacy game but still it, very exciting in particular, just it's a you know it's Jurassic Park, one of my favorite the th things of all time, and I, I I feel legacies do better when they're built from the ground up. So I'm happy that this is like a its own game built yeah. with legacy in mind. Yeah, it does seem to be definitely influenced at least a little bit. I would say by pandemic legacy in terms of its structure w with some tweaks, but I would say the general like vibe of it. The way you have characters you can switch between and they have like unlockable abilities and stuff like that. But the gameplay obviously is completely different. The actual mechanics of the game itself. No, no, no. There, there's still T-Rexes in Pandemic. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, well, it's just a different thing. Uh, that game is Prospero Hall, right? Correct, yeah. Uh, they, I, I, and I think that's why I was... I'm... <laughs> Disclosure, I'm terrified of dinosaurs. So when I saw it, I was like, I don't have nothing to do with this game. <laughs> you should be. I, uh, My dad brought me to see that movie in theaters when I was a kid. And let me tell you, that did something to me. <laughs> like, that terrifying. So when I saw the booth, I was like, I'm good. But then I saw the Prospero Hall. And I was like, they've been knocking it out of the park for me as far as games between the Goonies and the Fast and Furious game. So I was like, oh, this is... I'm excited for this. I think I'm really going to enjoy this game. And as I started looking at it, I was like, oh, well, just sign me up. Just send it to me. Like, let's go. Let's play this. <laughs> yeah, they really have done a, such a great job with licenses. And I think they, they ride such a fine line between like making it mainstream accessible while still being interesting if you're mm -hmm. more of a deep gamer. And the, obviously the, the licensing and all that stuff is always top notch. So it, it's really cool to see. This is definitely their biggest game, as, as they said, that they have ever done. It's been in, in the works for a couple of years so far. And we should, that will be coming to Kickstarter and should be having a fast turnaround. At least that's what they're saying is that it'll be out before the end of the year next year. Oh, awesome. So that will be pretty exciting to have for Legacy Group. So overall, I yeah, I think we all really had a good time at PAX Unplugged, it <laughs> sounds like. it's It was a really cool show. And definitely... I mean, Gen, Gen Con is always more exciting to me. You know, that's where you get the the really exciting new announcements and really hot brand new games that you get to play. But PAX is kind of the other side of that coin. It's 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 more laid back. I can kind of I can sleep a little longer. <laughs> uh, we don't have to drive as far to get there. That's a big plus. <laughs> uh, so uh, I it's it's it makes me very happy. I'm glad that I'm glad that it's finally back and we get to continue going to it. Do us a favor, like this video, subscribe to our channel, or if you really like us, you can support us on Patreon, become a high roller today for exclusive bonus content. We also have a podcast now. You can check that out at rollforcrit.com slash podcast, weekly episodes with special guests you definitely want to listen to.